very good. Thank, th thank you very much for the uh, introduction, Mark, and uh, thank you for inviting me along this evening to, uh, to speak to the Hereford Astronomical Society. Um, it seems that we're getting a little bit more familiar with you using Zoom. Certainly in the BAA, uh, we're not allowed to have any uh, physical meetings and uh, we're doing a, a, a weekly uh, Zoom uh, cast. Um, there's always a little bit of a worry how the technical uh, aspects in the IT will come together, but uh, I'd like to thank Chris very much for uh, uh, the preparation he's, he's done in, uh, in advance of tonight's uh, uh, talk. Um, so for me, welcome to, to South Cheshire. I'm, I'm sitting uh, about uh, 14 miles south of, of, of Chester uh, and uh, I have a, a small observatory here and uh, my passion is, is variable stars. So tonight I'm going to tell you uh, a little bit about uh, how to get started in variable star uh, astronomy. Wh why, why observe variable stars? I think that's uh, uh, probably the first question that we want to address. I'll cover um, some aspects about what equipment you need and a, a little spoiler here, you don't need any equipment beyond your naked eye if you don't wish. Um, I'll spend a little bit of time talking about two particular variable stars that are, uh, that are well placed at the moment and they have uh, quite a lot of uh, astrophysical significance so we'll look at uh, how to observe those stars and also what we might learn from them. Uh, and then towards the end of the talk uh, I'll uh, uh, ratchet it up a few levels and talk a little bit about my uh, own interest in, in variable star astronomy which is this uh, fascinating group of, of objects known as the cataclysmic variables uh, and this is a field where uh, amateur astronomers are making uh, a, a lot of contributions at the moment and, and, and over the last few years. Now hopefully on, on this first slide here you can see some, some, uh, some stars varying um, if you look carefully, they're varying acro across the field at, at various times. And I always like to start off uh, presentations on variable stars by showing this picture of, uh, of M3, the, uh, the great globular star cluster. Uh, it's uh, an animated video and it's obviously uh, sped up many, many fold. And each of those stars you can see varying is, is called a, a cluster variable star or an RR Lyrae variable star. And what I particularly like about these stars is that they were actually discovered uh, more than 125 years ago by a BAA member who was also a member of the variable uh, star section, uh, a gentleman called David Packer, who uh, uh, discovered them from, while observing in, in London. Uh, but uh, most of his uh, uh, amateur astronomical observing career he spent from south. He spent observing from South Birmingham. And I think what this, what this shows you is that uh, many stars uh, are variable and of course even our sun is, is variable to uh, uh, an extent, a very small extent and I, I think we can all breathe a sigh of relief that it's not as variable as uh, some of these objects that we'll be looking at uh, tonight. In fact we're, we're very uh, lucky that the, that, that, that the star doesn't do that because we probably wouldn't be uh, uh, able to survive on earth if that was the case. So why observe variable stars? Well, yeah, it's fun, it's exciting, and it's useful, but for many of us there's actual great pleasure involved at being able to go out uh, night after night, uh, looking at a star, seeing how its brightness changes, and at the same time wondering why it's changing, what are the reasons uh, behind it? And after a while, actually after a short while, you find that they become good friends. Each star has its own personality, its own character, and uh, like any good friend, you're, you're keen to go out each night to find uh, out what it's up to. Is it fainter? Is it, is it brighter? What on earth is it up, uh, up to? So that's the, the enjoyment that I, that I get uh, uh, out of variable star observing. But there, there, there are other reasons why the collection of, of data on uh, variable stars is, is actually quite, quite useful. Uh, and uh, over the years, it's been shown that uh, research on variable stars provides a lot of information uh, about the star itself or stars like the one uh, that you choose to observe. You can find out how much it weighs, uh, how big it is, how luminous, luminous it is. You may be able to tell the temperature of the star, also something about the, uh, the structure or the composition of the star and even how far through its life uh, it's, it, it has got and uh, uh, what may lie uh, in store in the future. And some variable stars 
need to be observed over decades in order to term, determine their uh, long-term variation. Uh, but other stars, uh, well, their brightness changes over a matter of minutes or even seconds, as we'll see uh, a little bit later in the talk. I, I think for, for me, variable star observing becomes even more interesting when uh, professional astronomers uh, request the data uh, that we amateurs have, uh, uh, have recorded, um, often under difficult conditions. You know, we go out night after night, it's cold, it's damp. Uh, sometimes we have to go through contortions to observe the star. So it's wonderful when a, when a professional takes those data away, they carry out some analysis, uh, and from that they uh, deduce amazing snippets uh, of information uh, about the star or the system. For some reason it's disappeared off my screen there. Shall we, uh, don't quite know what happened there. Uh, um, Jeremy, feel free to yep. put your video on as well, but everybody else is off, but we, we're happy to see your face if you want, or you can choose, it's up to okay, you. Let yeah, let me let me put that uh, stop video. Uh, That's it. We can okay. see. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You can. You got me. All yeah. right. Let's. For some reason, the uh, PowerPoint no, closed it. itself. It's, so it. um, we'll go from slideshow, and we we'll go from the current one, uh, and we'll just hop forward to to, to that. So I was just explaining about uh, the uh, professionals' uh, interest in what we're doing, and quite quite, quite often uh, we find that. Uh, having gone out uh, to observe a particular star, our observations that we've obtained on that star uh, on that particular night may be the only ones in existence uh, for, for, for that object. So uh, it, they could provide uh, great value to, to, to the professionals. I think it's, it, it's fair to say uh, that increasingly professionals uh, simply don't have the time or, or access to, to telescopes to monitor uh, every star uh, all the time. Uh, so they rely on amateurs for that. And uh, also, if, if a star begins to, to show unusual behavior, uh, professionals, uh, often observing with a satellite in orbit around the, uh, the Earth, uh, may uh, request observations from the amateurs to, uh, to, to back up their, their, their data. And uh, on many occasions, I've been involved in campaigns with professionals where the amateurs are observing visually or with their own CCD cameras uh, and the professionals are observing in, in infrared or, or maybe even radio or, or, or x-ray observations. So putting those different uh, pieces of information uh, together, it provides a lot of information about the star. So let's start by looking at uh, a particular recent example of a, a variable star uh, activity. And, uh, uh, as the as a director of the BAA variable star section, um, I, I, I would have to admit that it's not often that variable stars uh, feature on the main news programmes. But in fact, one did uh, at the end of last year and, and, and the beginning of this year. Uh, and uh, uh, that star was uh, was Betelgeuse, the uh, uh, the star in, uh, in in Orion. And the reason why it reached the news is that it was uh, undergoing a fade. It was getting it was getting fainter. And there was lots of speculation uh, at the time uh, that Betelgeuse was about to become a supernova and uh, people estimated how bright it would be and visible dur during the day. And one of the reasons for that is that Betelgeuse is, is known to be a, a red supergiant star and it is getting towards the end of its life. Uh, and therefore it's, it's entirely possible, maybe even likely, uh, that at some stage in say the next 100,000 years, uh, it is going to turn into a, a supernova. Uh, but I have to say right away that that is not connected with this uh, recent fading event. So that's why it received news coverage because it was particularly exciting. I'm sure you all know Betelgeuse. Uh, it's instantly recognizable. It's the, uh, uh, the right shoulder of Orion. And normally it's one of the, the 10 brightest stars in the, in the night sky. Uh, but last October, uh, it began to, uh, to, to dim. Uh, and by mid-February, uh, it had lost more than two-thirds of its brightness. And you can see in the animation on the top left here, it's, it's, it's two slides taken by Tim Weatherall in, 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 in Somerset. Uh, one in uh, February of uh, last year, uh, and one in January of this year when it was, when it was a lot fainter. So two-thirds of, of its brightness has, has gone. Um, so visual observers 
simply using their naked eye, found that the star faded from where it normally is at around magnitude 0.5, so, so, so very bright, down to uh, magnitude 1.7 uh, in February, uh, towards the middle of February. And you, you can see that in this light curve on, on the bottom. Um, just, just to explain, I'll, I'll be showing one or two other light curves just to show you what's going on here. So if you look on the, uh, 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 on the x-axis at the bottom, you can see the date. So this is going back to uh, uh, October of last year, all the way through to the right-hand side, which is, which is April this year, when we began to lose Orion in the western sky. So light curves have the final on the bottom. And on the, uh, the y-axis, the, the axis going up, you can see the brightness of the star or, or, the, or the magnitude of the star. And uh, the, the higher up that scale it is, the brighter the star is. So you can see at the beginning of the plot, it's about magnitude 0.5, and then it fades uh, during January to a minimum in, in, in February. Uh, and then uh, it brightened again towards the end of that ob observing uh, season. Um, what we know about Bejeveld, as we have known for many years, is actually a, a, a pulsating star. Seem to have lost it again. Um, that's it we got it got it back again yep uh so it's, it, it, this star pulsates it expands and contracts and it does this uh, along different periods and there, there seem to be two two main periods uh, one is a variation over about 430 days uh, and one uh, over around six years so a much longer uh, period and it seems that at least part of this fade was due to the, both those cycles coinciding. Um, but, they, but that didn't explain the whole thing. And uh, astronomers were, were, were scratching their head uh, for quite a while uh, until the, uh, some images were taken with a very large telescope in Chile, which is shown at the top, top right here. And uh, you can, th these, these images show that uh, during December and, and, and through into January of this, this year, uh, there was a dusky cloud uh, crossing part of Bejeveld's and, uh, and that was also contributing to, uh, to this fading. So uh, it, it seems that Bejeveld's is giving off uh, dusty material, uh, uh, particles of, uh, of, uh, uh, of dust, uh, and these are forming a disk around the star, and that disk ha has been uh, occluding some of the light from, from the star. So that explains the fade. Um, I think it's, uh, it's worthwhile that most of these astrophysical observations were, were, were deduced from amateur observations. Uh, and one of the reasons is that Betelgeuse is so bright, it's, it's too bright for most professional telescopes and, uh, and satellites uh, to, to follow it properly. So, they so the professionals have relied on, on amateur ob observations. Uh, so we've lost, we've lost Orion obviously summertime now, but it will be coming back in uh, uh, later this year. So do keep a, a, an eye on Betelgeuse. Uh, there's a, an article in the, in the current BAA Variable Star Section Circular, which you can download for free from the BAA website, by uh, Dr. Mark Kidger, who's a professional. Uh, and uh, he's, he's studied all these aspects, including those different periods. And he's, he's uh, suggesting that in April next year, there will also be another fade, uh, not as faint as this one, uh, but another fade nonetheless, because those two cycles will coincide once again. So uh, look, for, look out for Betelgeuse uh, throughout uh, the autumn, winter, and early spring next year. So let's let's talk about uh, the sort of equipment uh, that, that you need. And I, I'd, I'd like to emphasize that one of the beauties of variable star astronomy is that you can use any kit. Use the kit that you have already. You don't need to go out and buy uh, new uh, pieces of equipment. If you don't have a telescope, don't worry. Naked eye observations are, are, are great. And we've just seen that, how important they are in uh, observations of, of, of Betelgeuse. Uh, binoculars, also also very good. A uh, small pair of binoculars, here's my 8x42, uh, can provide a lifetime uh, of opportunity uh, with observing the, uh, the variables. Very roughly, there, there are two kinds of, of variable star observing. Uh, what, one is where you uh, compare uh, the brightness of a variable star uh, with stars of known brightness in, its, in, in the same field. 
uh, using your eye. So this is visual variable star astronomy. Uh, but other people uh, prefer to use imaging, either with a CCD camera or perhaps a DSLR camera. And here you take an image of the variable and its surrounding stars, just like you would with a, uh, any deep sky object. Uh, and then you use software later to, to work out what the brightness of the star was in the, uh, when you made the observation. Uh, you don't even need to have your own telescope. Many people uh, use remote telescopes uh, for imaging stars. Uh, uh, there's a lot of interest in, them in, in, in spectroscopy. And don't worry even if it's cloudy because there, there are plenty of data to, to analyze uh, on cloudy nights or, or, or long summer nights as we have at the moment. So lots of opportunities uh, uh, to get involved in, in variable star astronomy. I think it's fair to say that most people uh, observe variable stars on their own, standing or sitting in the, in, in the back garden, that's certainly what I do. But I want to emphasize that variable star astronomy is actually very much a team sport. Um, let's, let, let, let's see what I mean by that. So, so here we have a, a plot of a, the brightness of a star from the uh, variable star section database. So again, you, uh, hopefully you will remember from the Betelgeuse plot, uh, along the bottom of the axis you can see uh, uh, the date, which runs from about 2001 down to, uh, well, the, uh, 2019. Uh, and then uh, you can see uh, the brightness up the, uh, up the y-axis, uh, the, uh, the side axis. And you can see uh, there are a few observations plotted uh, on, on, this, uh, on this light curve. Uh, and these, these, obser these observations were made by uh, my colleague Sean Albrighton from the Variable Star section. Uh, Sean lives in, in Tamworth. He mainly uses uh, binoculars for his observing. And you can see that there are quite a few gaps in the data and there, there are various reasons for that. And uh, there, uh, everybody has things to do other than observing variable stars. So uh, sometimes you're not able to observe because, uh, because of work or the weather's bad. Uh, so inevitably, if you observe uh, uh, just on your own, there'll be these large gaps in the data. Then, nonetheless, you can see something interesting was perhaps happening towards the right of the, of the light curve. So uh, there, there was a, a, a series of almost vertical uh, data points which showed the star was varying in brightness. But it wasn't possible to say what's going on. So let's, let's add a, uh, another uh, observers uh, data to, to Sean's. And th th these are data from, from Mike Gainsford. Uh, it's probably a bit of a, a, a small plot there, but uh, a picture of, of Mike. But uh, if, if you were able to see his T-shirt, uh, you'd realize he's a, a Leicester City supporter. He lives in Leicester. Uh, and uh, I'm in regular contact with Mike. He's in his 80s, uh, still observing variable stars. But uh, from this plot, you can already see there's more detail in the light curve uh, from the greater coverage of adding Mike's uh, observations to, to Sean ob Sean's observations. But it's also fair to say that there are still some, some gaps. So again, what's going on there? Let's add another 53 uh, observers and the names are, are shown at the bottom. And uh, we end up with this really uh, extraordinarily complex, I, I would actually describe it as beautiful uh, light curve, uh, of uh, the first star that I'm going to talk about uh, this evening, the star R Corona Borealis in, in, in the Northern Crown. One reason why, why our uh, Corona Borealis is so interesting is that it undergoes these uh, unpredictable fades. Uh, if, you, if you look about a third of the way along the plot, you see a sudden uh, drop in brightness uh, as the star faded from sixth magnitude, so on the limit of uh, naked eye uh, visibility, all the way down to, to 15th magnitude uh, over uh, relatively few days. And uh, over succeeding months, it, it, it brightened a little bit. A couple of times it fell back to, to its faint stage. Uh, during 2015, it almost recovered to, uh, to its brightest level again, but then faded. And then gradually during uh, 2016 and 2017, it, uh, it recovered its, uh, its, its brightness. So, I mean, th th those changes are really quite dramatic. We're talking about uh, a change in brightness of eight magnitudes in something like thir 33 days. Um, so, 
I guess the question is what what on earth's going on on with this star? So let's let's have a look. Now, our Corona Borealis is, uh, uh, has been a, a favourite amongst uh, observers since its discovery over 200 years ago. And it was discovered by uh, uh, a gentleman called uh, Edward, Edward Piggott. Uh, he was observing from Bath at the time. And I, I need to point out that it was the, the city of Bath. He wasn't actually in the Bath. Um, I understand that's not a particularly good way of uh, observing variable stars. Uh, and uh, he reported it to the uh, Royal Society in 1797. So what do we know about our Corona Borealis? Well, it's a, it's a yellow star, uh, and it's about 100 times bigger uh, than the sun. And astronomers describe it as a, as a highly evolved star. So it's, it's evolved through a long lifetime uh, to where it is at the moment. And it's a little bit different from, from most stars, because most stars um, uh, contain a lot of hydrogen, or they're mostly, mostly hydrogen. Uh, but our Corona Borealis uh, is, is very uh, poor uh, uh, in, in hydrogen. Uh, it's only about 1% of it is hydrogen, uh, whereas 90% of it is the next heaviest uh, element, which is, which is helium. It also contains a, a number of other heavy, heavier elements, like, like carbon uh, and nitrogen. And it even contains some molecules uh, like uh, cyanogen, which is uh, carbon joined to, to nitrogen. And what uh, astronomers now know is uh, what they have been able to do, deduce uh, is that uh, uh, the fading is due to the condensation of, of carbon soot uh, onto the uh, onto the surface of the star. Um, there's an animation that's been running. I've just just started it uh, a, a, a again. Uh, so uh, the, the carbon, the soot in the star's atmosphere. Uh, begins to condense near, near the surface and gets, gets bigger and bigger as you can see in that animation uh, and that causes the, uh, the brightness of the star uh, to, to decrease. Uh, and there's a, an artist's impression of what it might look like uh, on the top right there. Uh, this is obtained uh, from uh, observations with the, uh, the Very Large Telescope. Uh, again, you can see a cloud of, of carbon soot on the right hand side of the, of the star. So the soot uh, uh, deposits or, or gets near the surface, but as you can see in the animation now, eventually it gets pushed away uh, back uh, out into space uh, and the star uh, re, re brightens. And our Corona Borealis is, is the archetype of actually a very select group of, of, of stars. Um, the, the family itself contains only around 150 stars uh, in, in our galaxy uh, that are of this uh, similar nature, so it's quite rare. Um, I'd also like to point out that the, uh, the second brightest after our Corona Borealis of, of this family of stars uh, was uh, discovered by a previous director of the variable star section, uh, Colonel Markwick, uh, all the way back in uh, 1893. So let's talk about observing uh, our Corona Borealis. First of all, how, how do you find it? Well, the, the good news is it is actually quite an easy star to observe. And uh, this uh, uh, plot here uh, shows you what the sky would look like tonight if it remains clear, if you went out uh, uh, around midnight, uh, looking to, to the south. Uh, maybe you can just, if you've got a low horizon, maybe just see uh, Antares poking among, uh, above the, uh, the southern horizon. Uh, looking towards the southeast, uh, you can see the uh, the summer triangle coming into view. Uh, Deneb right at the top there, uh, Vega and Alta uh, marking the uh, uh, the three corners of, of, of the triangle. If you look to the southwest, you'll see uh, another bright star called called Arcturus. And uh, if you're not entirely sure how to find Arcturus, it's quite simple. If you follow the curve of the handle of the Big Dipper round. Uh, it will eventually point to Arcturus. And Arcturus is the, the brightest star in the constellation of Boutes, the, the herdsman. Uh, you can just see it uh, above Arcturus there. I, I, I always think it looks like a, an elongated kite. And just uh, nestling just, just below Boutes is the northern crown Corona Borealis. By the way, uh, if you look to the north at about the same time, uh, you might even see some noctilucent cloud. Uh, there have been quite a few reports uh, over recent nights and uh, some very good images taken e even last night. But at the moment, we're looking south. 
So here's an, uh, an enlarged view of, uh, of the Northern Crown, and you can see uh, uh, the circling of stars that it's made up of, and, and quite near the centre is, uh, is a fainter star uh, that's conveniently marked here uh, called R. And it's easily visible in a, in a small pair of binoculars, uh, uh, certainly at the moment, but when it, when it fades, you'll need quite a large telescope. But at the moment, it, it is fairly bright, so binoculars uh, uh, are, are ideal to, uh, to follow it at the moment. So if you wish to estimate the brightness uh, of, of R, you can download a chart, uh, a comparison star chart, such as the one that uh, is shown here, uh, from the Variable Star section uh, web website. And you can see, if you look closely, the stars that make up the Northern Crown. Uh, you can see the, uh, the, the, the circlet, maybe, but there are quite a few other fainter stars that you won't see with the naked eye, but you will see uh, in binoculars. And it's, uh, you can see R marks right in the center there, like all variable star charts, the variable is shown uh, by a, a dot with a small circle around it. And it's simply a matter of comparing that, the, the brightness of R with stars uh, in, uh, in, in its vicinity. Now I was observing R last night with my uh, eight by 42 binoculars, and I had it slightly uh, fainter than, than star C on this chart. Uh, and uh, I, I reckon it was uh, R was about magnitude 6.1. So it's definitely keeping, uh, uh, worth keeping an eye on. Uh, it's bright at the moment, but uh, we don't know when it will fade next. Uh, and uh, even, it, even its brightness, you will, uh, its brightest, you will see some variations in brightness if you follow it over a, a few days or, or, or weeks. So certainly one to, uh, to keep in, uh, in view over the, uh, the rest of the summer into the autumn. Uh, this chart here shows uh, an enlarged view of the centre of, of the Northern Crown and uh, the star right at the centre, uh, which you can see flashing on and off, is our Corona Borealis. This is an image taken by Greg Parker from the New Forest. And uh, there are two images here. Uh, one uh, that was taken when the, uh, the star was in its fainter state at around fourth, uh, uh, 14th magnitude, uh, and another one uh, when it was bright and that was back in 2013 when it was bright and around uh, eighth magnitude. So you can see what a, what a huge variation in, in, in brightness uh, there is with this star. So that's our Corona Borealis. Let's look at a, uh, another famous uh, variable in, in the Northern Crown, and this time uh, it's T Corona Borealis. Now, T is, is actually a very different star for, for, from ours, completely different, and you can see it marked here. It's just outside the, uh, this little circlet of the, uh, of the uh, northern crown, uh, just below Epsilon Corona Borealis. Uh, you can see the little T, T mark there. Now normally T uh, slumbers at around 10th magnitude, but if you were to go back to 1866 and uh, observing on, on May the 12th, uh, you would have found it to be very bright. And the, the, the gentleman that did discover this, this outburst was a, uh, uh, a John Birmingham, uh, who was observing from Chewham in Galway in, in, in Ireland. Uh, and he saw it as, as a new star. It had never been seen in, this, in the sky before. It's a new star or, or, or a nova. And as, at its brightest, it was uh, uh, magnitude two, uh, easily visible to the naked eye. And it outshone uh, every other star uh, in, in the Northern Crown, in, including Alfeca, which is the, uh, the brightest star, as you can see here. John Birmingham actually uh, reported his observations to the Times of London by, by letter and uh, they, uh, the Times uh, dismissed it, they, did, they didn't publish it, uh, but fortunately uh, uh, John Birmingham had also sent uh, a letter to uh, a famous astronomer in South London called, uh, called Huggins, William Huggins, uh, and Huggins was a pioneer of the spectroscopy and uh, it enabled Huggins to obtain the, the first spectrum uh, of, a, of a nova. Uh, in, in, in history. Um, Birmingham was so enthused by, by his discovery that he uh, 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 ordered a telescope, a four and a half inch refractor, and studying variable stars became his life. Uh, and he published a, a, a catalogue of 658 of these stars and was uh, awarded the, the gold medal of the Royal Irish Academy uh, for, his, for his work. But the story doesn't end there. For 80 years later, uh, and we're now talking about the morning of uh, uh, February the 9th, 1946, 
the nova actually sprang back into life uh, and it was discovered independently uh, that morning uh, by two observers. Uh, the first to spot it was actually a, a BAA member, uh, a gentleman called Norman Knight, uh, who lived in Bedford Park in, in, in London. Uh, and then around two and a half hours later, it was independently discovered by uh, the gentleman shown on, on the left here, uh, Armin Deutsch. Uh, Deutsch uh, at the time was a, a graduate student at the Yerkes Observatory, uh, but on that uh, occasion, uh, he didn't need to use the, uh, the wonderful 40-inch refractor at Yerkes. Uh, instead, he was using uh, binoculars. Uh, it, it, if you read up about the discovery of this 1946 outburst, mo most of the literature purely cites uh, Armin Deutsch's discovery uh, as a discoverer. But uh, looking in a little bit more detail, it, it, it's clear that uh, he was uh, beaten uh, to the event by uh, uh, the English uh, astronomer Norman Knight of uh, Bedford Park in London. So I always like to point, to point that out. This time, uh, in this outburst, the, the star reached uh, third magnitude. And uh, there was a, uh, living at the time, there was a very famous uh, American uh, amateur astronomer uh, who was an enthusiastic uh, comet hunter, uh, a variable star ob observer called Leslie Peltier. Uh, and, and Leslie uh, had an inclination uh, for some years before this, uh, this brightening, uh, that uh, T might suddenly reappear in the night sky. And he followed it every night, uh, every clear night uh, uh, possible for, for 25 years, hoping to catch it suddenly brightening. Uh, but on that morning in, in 1946, he'd set his alarm for 2.30 in the morning to spend some time with the, the pre-dawn variables. Uh, he got up, drew his curtains back. It was a clear morning. Uh, he could see the skies twinkling, but uh, he felt a little tickle at the back of his throat, a little bit of a cough, and uh, he knew he was coming down with a, with a cold. Uh, so he decided to go, to go back to bed uh, on, on that morning. And uh, as a consequence, uh, he, mit he missed out discovering the, uh, the re-brightening of T. Corona Borealis. And uh, I have a lot of sympathy for, for Leslie Peltier because uh, I, I've, I've lost track of the number of times uh, I, I've got up uh, in the small hours of the morning, thought, no, I'd rather go back, back to bed. Uh, Peltier never really forgave himself, and he never really forgave T either. Uh, he always kept a wary eye on that star, uh, and he followed it uh, for, the, for the rest of his life. Um, by the way, as, uh, Leslie Peltier, I'm a, I'm a great fan of Le Leslie. Uh, his, his book, his autobiography, uh, Starlight Nights, uh, two, two versions of which are, are shown on the slide here, is a great read. If you, if you haven't read it, please do so. Uh, he describes uh, not about uh, how and why variables uh, vary, uh, but he describes his love of observing the night sky. A great, a great read. I tend to read it once a year, usually on summer holiday, to remind myself why I love uh, a, a astronomy. Uh, and there are all sorts of anecdotes in there, so I can't recommend it uh, highly enough. So, Let's look at uh, a little bit more detail about what's happening with T Corona Borealis. Um, it's actually a binary star. So it's, it's made up of a, uh, of a red giant star. That's the, uh, the big star on the right here. Uh, and that star is orbiting a much smaller star uh, known as a white dwarf. And you can just about see from time to time the, the, uh, the white dwarf in, in the center there. And the white dwarf has a, an extremely strong uh, uh, gravitational field uh, and that causes material to be drawn off uh, the uh, the red giant star and as uh, material as you can see it in in, in the diagram here as material uh, spiral uh, uh, heads towards the white dwarf it actually spirals in uh, and accumulates in in this uh, matter around the white dwarf called called an accretion disk now Eventually, some of that material in the accretion disk gets funneled down on, onto the surface of the white dwarf. And uh, after a while, so much material builds up, it becomes highly compacted, it becomes really hot, uh, and eventually ignites in a, ther in a thermonuclear explosion. And it's that that gives the uh, spectacular outburst that we know as a, as a MOVA. So what we see is a sun brightening of the star, uh, as shown in this animation here. Uh, as 
the thermonuclear explosion occurs, the, uh, the outer layers are, are blown away into, into space, leaving what you can see now, which is a, a planetary nebula, a very uh, diffuse gas cloud uh, around, the, uh, uh, around that white dwarf. So that's, a, that's how a nova explosion occurs, it's a thermonuclear explosion. But that explosion doesn't destroy the star, it doesn't destroy the secondary, the, uh, the, uh, the red giant, and it doesn't destroy the white dwarf. Uh, so the whole process begins again, uh, and it's believed that all novae uh, are recurrent, recur on at least some time scale. Uh, clearly, T. Corona Borealis does it uh, more frequently, we've seen it the 80 year uh, uh, distance between the, the two outbursts I've talked about so far, uh, but other novae may recur on uh, in a period of thousands or even tens of thousands of, uh, of years. So let's look at the, uh, 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 the light curve of T. Corona Borealis. So I mentioned that this gap between uh, the, the, those two previous uh, explosions of around, around 80 years. Uh, and that's led people to speculate that we, we're probably due for uh, another uh, outburst in the next few years. Uh, if you think about it, the 80th anniversary of the last eruption will occur in 2026. Now this is not guaranteed it will occur, there's, there's, there's often a wide uh, variation in, in, in how these events pan out, but um, it's for that reason that uh, T. Corona Borealis has attracted uh, a lot of interest uh, over the years. And after the 1946 uh, explosion, it, it basically T. Corona Borealis stayed uh, at minimum light, essentially under the radar for, for the next 69 years, typically around magnitude 10.3. But that began to change in, in 2015. Uh, you can see about three quarters of the way along this light curve here, there's a bit of a, 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 an inflection upwards uh, in, in, in the data. And it re reached a peak, you can see here in February 2016, there was a peak of brightness in around, at around magnitude 9.2. Now that, that actual very bright state wasn't uh, sustained for more than a few weeks, and it, uh, uh, it faded back slightly. Uh, but uh, in the, uh, the, the last uh, four years since, since that brightening, uh, it has remained in a significantly brighter state than it has done for any of the previous uh, 69 years. Um, alongside that brightening trend, uh, astronomers have discovered that the star has become bluer at the same time. And this brightening and, uh, uh, and the star becoming more bluer is known as a, a superactive state of T. Corona, corona Borealis. And it's rather tantalizing to, to think that the last time uh, T went into a superactive state was in 1938, some eight years before the, uh, the 1946 uh, explosion. So the question is, uh, will T Corona Borealis uh, outburst tonight, in the next week, in the next months, in the next few years? Well, who knows? We, we simply don't know uh, when it will be, but surely it's worth keeping an eye on. Uh, at the moment, you'll need a something like a, a three-inch refractor to, to, to see it. Um, and again, you can uh, obtain uh, star charts uh, from the BAA Variable Star section uh, website, and that will show you how to find the, the star. Uh, when, it, when it does go off, and it, and, it, and it almost certainly will go off in the next few years, uh, you won't have long to observe it, because based on the, the last two uh, e explosions, uh, it'll only remain in naked eye brightness for uh, maybe five, maximum six days. So it'll be for a very short period of time. So, Novi, like uh, T. Corona Borealis, are the, uh, uh, the most dramatic examples of a, of a class of variables I want to, to talk a little bit more about now, known as the, the cataclysmic variable stars. And often these are referred to as CVs for, for cataclysmic variables. Um, CVs, like the Novi, are, are, are binary stars. Uh, they contain a, a white dwarf in the center, the same as T did, uh, and then a secondary star in orbit around it. And, and usually in cataclysmic variables, that secondary star uh, is, a, is a red dwarf. And these are really compact systems. So the red dwarf and the white dwarf together uh, typically would fit in the, the Earth-Moon uh, orbit. 
so they are really compact binary stars uh, and uh, as I explained in the case of Novi the uh, the, mag the uh, uh, gravitational field of the of the white dwarf draws material off uh, the red dwarf and uh, you'll uh, get a, a, an accretion disk, this disk of matter forming around the, uh, the white dwarf. As you can see here, you can see the, the, the little white dwarf that actually shows blue in this slide, right in the center, and, a, and an accretion disk of, of, of gas, mainly hydrogen, uh, ar around it. Now, if on the other hand, the white dwarf uh, has a very strong magnetic field, something different occurs. Uh, it won't allow an accretion disk to form. So in this case, you'll find that the, uh, the stream of hydrogen from, from the secondary star is attracted towards one uh, of the poles of the, of the white dwarf. And you can see this uh, accretion gas uh, funnel uh, streaming down first on one pole of the, of the white dwarf and then on the, uh, the other pole. So we're just going to have to uh, uh, go from uh, through the slides again. Sorry about this, I don't know why it does that. Um, almost there. Yep, yeah. so there's the, uh, uh, there's the magnetic uh, white dwarf. And so that's if the, if the white dwarf is, is, is very strongly magnetic, uh, magnetically charged, there's, there's no accretion disk. Now, if we look at the, uh, the third example here, we've, we find an intermediate situation. And, and in this case, uh, yes, the white dwarf does have a, a magnetic field, uh, but it's not as strong as the, the one at the top right. And in this case, you can still get uh, an accretion disk formed. Uh, it's not as large uh, as you would get if there was no magnetic uh, field because the magnetic field sort of uh, gorges out the middle part of that uh, accretion disk. Now these, these cataclysmic variable stars, uh, whatever their type, show variations on, on a huge range of timescales uh, from seconds all the way through to, to decades. And for me, that's what makes them so, so interesting. They're, they're always doing something. Um, now the most exciting events uh, are, are the outbursts, these sudden brightenings of the, of the star. Uh, and uh, in the case of a, of a novi, as we saw for T Corona Borealis, the star can brighten, well, maybe more than uh, 10 million fold in just a matter of hours. So overnight, uh, the outburst can occur. Uh, and as we saw with T, uh, that cataclysm, hence cataclysmic variables, is caused by this uh, thermonuclear explosion. And uh, we saw uh, that animation uh, earlier. So the, the cataclysm of a, of a nova is, is extremely bright. Uh, so that's a nova. On the other hand, there's a there's a, a, another family of, of cataclysmic variables called the dwarf novae. And as, as the name suggests, these are, are far more modest events. Uh, the brightening is only around a hundredfold uh, 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 as, as an outburst occurs. Uh, and here, uh, the, the brightening isn't caused by a thermonuclear explosion. It actually takes place in that accretion disk. So what happens is that material builds up in the accretion disks uh, uh, until it reaches a, a density uh, where it drives the accretion disk into a very hot state through, through various astrophysical processes, including friction. So the accretion disk itself uh, brightens, and then after a while it will cool uh, and the star will fade, will fade again. And the reason why uh, these cataclysmic variable stars and dwarf novae are, are, are so interesting is that they provide a laboratory for studying these, these accretion disks, such as the one you can see on, 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 the, on the top left here. Why are accretion disks uh, important? Well, they're a fundamental feature of uh, many aspects of, of physics, and particularly astrophysics. Um, we see them in, in various branches of, of astronomy. For example, uh, when a star condenses uh, out of a, a primordial gas cloud, when it, when it forms, uh, it uh, condenses through, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, forms an accretion disk around, around that new star, and eventually that accretion disk will form into, into planets. That's how it's believed that the planets in our solar system form from an accretion disk around the proto-sun. Um, on a larger scale, uh, we, galaxies also have uh, accretion disks. Initially, they, uh, they're, they're formed out of, 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 of giant uh, uh, accretion disks. 
And as we'll see later, black holes also have accretion disks around them. So they're a fundamental property in, in, in physics, but they're really difficult to, uh, to, to characterize, to, to observe. And uh, one of the reasons for that is that uh, you can't actually see them. Certainly we can't, uh, uh, we can't see uh, how, the, how the, uh, the Earth and the solar system formed out of the sun's uh, accretion disk. So we can only infer by uh, analyzing other accretion disks. And similarly with, with black holes, uh, it's, it's, it, it's almost impossible. Well, it is impossible to see the accretion disk around, around a black hole. So studying, studying these accretion disks uh, provides a, a lot of information about the fundamental physics that, that's going on. So um, now, uh, one of the, uh, the, 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 the best known uh, of these uh, uh, dwarf novae, the, the class of cataclysmic variables I want to look at now, is, is a star called SS Cygni. And uh, SS Cygni has been uh, observed ever since it was discovered way back in, uh, in 1896. Uh, by uh, Louisa D. Wells, who was working at the, the Harvard College Observatory in the United States. Uh, that observatory was one of the most prolific discovery sites for, for variable stars at the, at the time. And uh, the director, Edward Pickering, uh, employed over, the, over many years uh, dozens of, uh, of women computers, uh, as they were called. So uh, these women uh, analyzed the uh, uh, photographic plates taken of the night sky and identified variable stars uh, with them and from those analysis they discovered uh, all sorts of important uh, astrophysical uh, phenomena for example one of the uh, uh, the computers working uh, at harvard was uh, henrietta levitt and uh, and henrietta levitt's work uh, on studying the brightness changes in the cepheid variables uh, allowed uh, astronomers to uh, to work out the standard candle measurement for working out cosmic dis uh, distances, and that that uh, relationship that she derived was later used by Edward Hubble uh, to determine the distance of the uh, the Andromeda uh, galaxy. So Louisa Wells discovered uh, SS Sydney, as I said, in 1896, and uh, it's been followed intensively ever since. And you can see a plot here. Don't look at the details of the plot, but, but essentially uh, astronomers, and mostly amateur astronomers, have uh, observed every single outburst of this star uh, in the intervening period. And there's, there's well over a thousand of them that have been uh, discussed, so that's uh, been discovered. So that's quite a, an observational feat. If you look at the, uh, the expanded plot at the top right, uh, you can see these outbursts. So you can see the star spends about, well, roughly three quarters of its time at a, at a, at a faint uh, magnitude of around, around 12. Uh, but every couple of months or so, uh, it brightens within a few hours to the, to the eighth magnitude. It stays there for, for a few days, uh, and then it fades back to, uh, to the faint state again. Uh, what we know after, uh, analyzing a th uh, thousands or more than a thousand of these outbursts is you, you can't actually predict precisely when the uh, the next outburst will, will occur and so they don't occur uh, strictly periodically they just they occur quasi periodically so roughly uh, once every 40 days or so does it go into into outburst and s a signi because it's uh, uh, the brightest of these dwarf novae is is, is well uh, monitored by by amateur astronomers and it's quite common for professionals to ask amateurs to alert them to, uh, to a subsequent or forthcoming uh, outburst such that they can uh, uh, train satellites or, or large telescopes uh, on, on them. Uh, to observe SS Cygni, uh, you only need uh, a relatively small telescope. To observe it at minimum, you'll probably be using something like a six inch uh, telescope, uh, but at, uh, at its brightest, uh, a smaller telescope will, will do. Uh, it's relatively easy to find. Uh, it's uh, sitting in the, uh, the northeast of the constellation of, of, of Cygnus and uh, not too far from the, the star Deneb. Now, one of my own uh, observational programs uh, is to patrol for outbursts of these uh, uh, cataclysmic variables using a, a CCD camera on my uh, 11 inch telescope which is shown in the center here this is the uh, the c11 in my my observatory uh, 
Other people use different instruments. You can see uh, my friend Gary Poyner on the left here. He's a, a, a visual observer uh, located uh, quite close to the center of Birmingham. You can see his 20-inch uh, telescope there. Uh, and on the right there, another member of the variable star section, Paul Leyland, who's lucky enough to have a 0.4 meter telescope uh, in, the, in the Canary Islands. But I must stress that you don't need to have uh, a telescope anywhere near as large as any of these, a uh, much smaller telescope will do. And for many years, uh, I was using a, a four inch refractor uh, and uh, I was uh, uh, quite satisfied with, uh, with the work I was doing on that. So what I do is, is uh, night after night, look at the, uh, uh, the location of where one of these uh, faint cataclysmic variables is. Usually it's invisible because it is so faint. Uh, but once in a while, uh, you download the image from the CCD camera and suddenly it's there. It's uh, really exciting. You see the star that you perhaps, uh, the field you've observed thousands of times over the years. And that one night you suddenly see it. And at that point, uh, you try and collect your thoughts and you go inside to uh, uh, email other interested observers, amateur and professional, uh, about, uh, uh, about what you've seen to alert them to enable uh, further observations to, to be obtained. And often this results in great uh, collaborations between amateurs and, uh, and professionals. And uh, quite often over the years, we, we, we write uh, papers together, jointly authored by professionals and, and amateurs. I will give a word of warning though, because if you do get into this and you do discover one of these, a particularly very rare outbursts of a star, it becomes well, almost addictive. You simply want to do this uh, time, time and time again. So one area of uh, cataclysmic variable star uh, astronomy that's attracted a lot of interest uh, is the study of the so-called super outbursts. Uh, of a particular kind of family of dwarf novae uh, known as the SU Ursa Majoris stars, so SU, SU Yuma uh, for short, uh, named after the archetypal system. Now, what's different about a, a super outburst is that it's uh, uh, brighter, typically by about a half a magnitude, than, than, the, than a normal outburst. And if you monitor the brightness of the star when it's in super outburst, you'll find uh, small bumps in the light curve. And you can see some of those uh, on, on the plot shown here. If you look at the plots below, you can see these little humps. And these are called, uh, these modulations are called super humps because they occur during a, uh, a super outburst. And the really interesting thing about these super humps is that they are uh, very slightly longer than the orbital period of this binary star. Because remember I explained earlier that uh, uh, dwarf novae, cataclysmic variables, are uh, binary stars with a white dwarf in the centre and usually a red dwarf going round the, uh, the edge. This is a, a, an example of a, uh, uh, of a SU Yuma, SU Earth Majoris system that we observed a, a, a few years ago. It's fairly faint, you can see that it, its brightness is around 13th magnitude, uh, visible with a fairly large telescope uh, visually, but uh, I observed it with a, a CCD uh, camera. And uh, you can find all sorts of uh, interesting data about the star from these uh, uh, long-term light curve uh, observations. So when it goes into outburst, it typically remains in that state for uh, a week or so, and then it will gradually fade uh, over a further week. So probably two weeks before it's back to its, uh, its normal brightness. And because it takes place over uh, two weeks, it's quite common for uh, amateur astronomers around the world to, to get involved in a campaign to observe a particular star. Uh, and the reason for that is that we want to obtain uh, as intensive and continuous coverage as possible during that, uh, uh, those two weeks. So having observers uh, geographically separated around the world is really helpful. Um, not only because you, it, it, it's bound to be dark uh, sometime on the, the Earth's surface, uh, but also because of weather conditions, it often means that uh, certain parts of the world are, are clouded out. So collaboration and cooperation is, is really important. So I'll turn to, to another uh, class of uh, cataclysmic variable star. And these are, are the stars that I was talking about earlier, where the magnetic, uh, uh, where the white dwarf has a, has a small magnetic field as shown in the, uh, the animation on the top left. 
this has a, an accretion disk, as, as you may remember, but uh, the middle part of the accretion disk is, is cored out or, or destroyed by, by the magnetic uh, field. And the white dwarf itself is, is, is rotating, uh, and it will rotate about 10 times uh, faster than the orbital period of that red dwarf going around it. And the, the red dwarf may go around it uh, in, in a, say, two hours, four hours, something of that order. So the white dwarf is, is, is spinning very, very quickly. And measuring the white dwarf spin period uh, has actually become quite a popular sport with uh, amateur uh, CCD observers over the years. and something that I uh, uh, get involved in. And there's a, a particular organization that's been set up uh, uh, to, to monitor these white dwarf spin periods. And uh, it rather grandiosely calls itself the Center for Backyard Astrophysics. I absolutely love that, that title. It's uh, coordinated by two professional observers. There's uh, Professor Joe Patterson from uh, Columbia University in, in, uh, in New York and uh, Enrique de uh, Miguel, who is located in Huelva University in, in the south of Spain. And they provide coordination uh, to, to the amateurs and uh, we will jointly uh, uh, write, uh, write papers and analyze the, uh, the, the data. And it, it, Monitoring these, these, these spin periods is, is, is a, is a long-term project and you can see in the, in the plot on the bottom right here how we've monitored the white dwarf spin period uh, of this particular star uh, between 2010 and, uh, and, and 2016 uh, and you can see that the, uh, the white dwarf uh, spin period is, is actually getting, getting smaller uh, so the, uh, the star uh, appears to be, uh, be, be speeding up. And uh, there's all sorts of astrophysical uh, uh, speculations as to, uh, as to why that should be. People come up with, with great theories uh, which explain it uh, completely. And yet in some uh, systems, we find completely the opposite uh, uh, variation in white dwarf periods. So something is not quite fully understood there. Uh, and hence it's important that, uh, that we amateurs uh, continue to, to monitor these stars. So another rather rare category of cataclysmic variables uh, are the family known as the helium dwarf novae, uh, and sometimes they're called uh, the AM Canaan Venaticorum stars, um, named obviously after the, uh, the first one that was uh, discovered. And these are also accreting binary stars, just as we've seen before, uh, but they, they contain a white dwarf uh, in the center, uh, as we've seen before, but on this occasion, or in this family, the secondary star is very different. It's not a red dwarf or a red dwarf, a giant. Uh, it's actually a, a helium star. So uh, it's a very old star where uh, nearly all the hydrogen has been converted to, to helium. And these are really compact systems. So I mentioned in the previous uh, uh, cataclysmic variables, they could typically fit in the Earth-Moon orbit. Well, the, these are much smaller. Uh, and the orbital period can be uh, as small as five minutes. So that the star is literally whizzing around uh, the white dwarf every five minutes. Uh, in the, uh, uh, the slower systems, it may take a, a, an hour or so, but that, 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 that's still uh, pretty, pretty quickly, pretty quick. And there are not that many of these uh, systems uh, known of these uh, helium dwarf novae. Uh, and it's uh, an area where amateur astronomers are also uh, uh, beginning to uh, make uh, great contributions because again uh, amateurs with uh, who have access to their telescopes uh, whenever they want can uh, uh, monitor the brightness of the star uh, and you can see uh, uh, an example here in the plot in the top left you can see some of these uh, uh, these humps again variations in the uh, in the brightness of, of the star uh, and this, this particular star here was the, fir uh, it was the first time this star uh, had been observed. It's a star in Andromeda called V744 Andromeda. And from those observations, we were able to, to work out the orbital period of that helium secondary star around the White Dwarf and, and found out that it was going around around 37 minutes. Uh, and that was the first time that that uh, measurement, that system had been measured. There are fewer than 60 of these uh, helium dwarf novae uh, known at the moment, but more are being discovered every day, uh, particularly by some of the large surveys uh, that are up there at the moment. Gaia has been particularly uh, attractive. And uh, bottom right here shows a, a, a system uh, observed by Gaia 
uh, in recent years. Uh, and this gives a, a, a hint of the exciting times ahead from other systems that, uh, that Gaia might, might detect. Uh, this particular uh, star, Gaia 14 AAE, unfortunately they have rather prosaic names, uh, was discovered in outburst by uh, a team of amateur astronomers. Uh, and uh, it was only the, uh, the, uh, the third uh, helium dwarf novae, uh, nova that was observed whereby the white dwarf was eclipsed by the helium star going, going around it. So that was uh, a really important observation. And uh, the, the, the team was coordinated by uh, Dr. Heather Campbell at, uh, at uh, Cambridge University, but many astro amateur astronomers around the world contributed to, uh, to the campaign. So that's helium dwarf novae, uh, a, a rather rare and exotic class of, of cataclysmic variables. So let's move on uh, one more. And until now, we've considered binary systems where the accreting uh, star at the center is a white dwarf. So we've looked at a number of examples of those uh, already. However, there's a, an even more exotic class uh, of, of binary system in which the accretor at the center is, is a black hole. And uh, just as with uh, dwarf novae and other cataclysmic variables with, with white dwarfs, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the, uh, the black hole, because of its strong magnetic field, can pull material off uh, uh, the orbiting secondary star. And again, you will have this accretion disk as the material flows in, it still has this angular momentum, you can see, so it spins around uh, uh, the, the black hole and uh, forming this, uh, this, this accretion disk. And this system here is, uh, uh, the animation which is shown here is a, is a star in Cygnus called V404 Cygni. And this is believed to contain uh, at the center of the accretion disk, a 17 solar mass black hole, so a pretty large uh, black hole. And uh, orbiting around it is the star you can see in the back there, a red giant star. And that's going around once, uh, around uh, every seven days or so. Now the most recent uh, outburst uh, of this particular system was observed uh, not so long ago uh, uh, in June 2015, so five years ago this month. Uh, it was first dis dis discovered to be an outburst by NASA's SWIFT satellite, so it was an x-ray detection, and that uh, triggered uh, hundreds if not thousands of instruments around the world to, to be trained uh, upon it. Uh, including uh, many uh, amateur observers and, uh, uh, and, and I had fun following that up as well. And many members of the BAA Variable Star section contributed to those observations. And it, it's, it's remarkable that a, a paper uh, summarizing all these results was, was published not long afterwards uh, in the journal Nature, which is the, uh, the world's most uh, pr prestigious uh, scientific publication. And uh, what, was, what was shown is that uh, as the material was spinning into the, uh, the white dwarf through this uh, accretion disk, uh, some of it was being spewed out again from the vicinity of the, of, of the black hole uh, by the, these jets. So you can see the jets uh, uh, coming out vertically or perpendicularly to, to, to the accretion disk in this, in, in this animation. And for me, this, this is incredible. The fact that I can go out on a clear dark night, if it's clear tonight, I'll be looking at V404 Sydney. It's not bright at the moment. Uh, it's, it, it's probably around 18th or 19th magnitude. But uh, when it was bright, I could go out uh, and observe the goings on of a, of a black hole some, well, 8,000 light years away. And I think that's, uh, that's pretty incredible. So I've only been able to show you a few examples of uh, some of the variable stars uh, uh, classes t uh, tonight. Um, this is only uh, a, a really small microcosm of, of variable star astronomy. Uh, there's lots more that, uh, uh, that I could tell you about, but I'm, I'm, I'm not. Uh, if you'd like to know more, please go to the uh, variable star section's uh, website. Uh, I should say that the VS VSS is the, uh, the longest established uh, variable star observing uh, organization uh, in the world. It was established in the same year as the BAA itself in, in, in 1890. 
and uh, we can provide all kinds of information and advice about uh, which stars to observe, how to observe them. If you're a visual observer, naked eye observer, binocular observer, or if you're a CCD observer. Uh, we can even put you in touch with mentors that can help you uh, up the learning curve. It can seem a little bit daunting uh, when, you, when you first start out. Uh, and therefore, having somebody that you can, you can call and get a, a, a advice from uh, can be quite helpful. So we have the mentoring scheme. Uh, we can provide charts. There are, there are dozens of those uh, comparison star charts, as I mentioned uh, earlier, from the, uh, available from the website. Uh, every quarter, we publish a, a, a circular. Uh, free for, uh, for download. Uh, please do uh, feel free to download the current one with the article by uh, Dr. Mark Kidger about Betelgeuse uh, in it. We pro publish some uh, observing guides. Uh, from time to time we have a, an observing campaign where we ask observers to, to concentrate on a particular star for a period of time. In fact we've just, just had one, the season has just come to an end. Uh, a, a star called uh, U in the constellation of, of Leo so you, Leonis, it's a, it's a fairly faint system. It's around 14th magnitude. And uh, we found it's been doing some rather unusual things. And uh, we've been scratching our heads as to what's going on. And uh, we, we, we've shared some of the data with uh, a great friend of the BAA Variable Star section, uh, uh, a guy called Professor Boris Gansica, uh, who's Professor of Astrophysics at Warwick University. And uh, he kindly ob uh, uh, obtained some time uh, back in April on the Isaac Newton telescope, which uh, sort of backed up the intriguing nature of this star based on what, what we'd found. Uh, and he's uh, now in the process of applying for a telescope uh, or uh, telescope time on uh, one of the world's uh, larger telescopes, because even the Isaac Newton telescope wasn't really big enough uh, for the sort of observations that we wanted to do. So. I hope this talk has uh, at least given you some indication of the way uh, amateurs can contribute to, to variable star astronomy. Uh, I fear I've only really scratched the surface here with, the, with, with those examples. Uh, but don't forget that whatever equipment you have uh, 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 available to you, whether it's the naked eye, binoculars, small telescope, or if you're uh, an imager of deep sky objects with a CCD camera, there is a variable star opportunity uh, awaiting uh, for you. So. I'm going to stop here. Uh, I could go on all night. You probably won't thank me for that. I'll stop here uh, and open for questions.